Hi everyone, Stephen Van Tassel here, Wildlife Control Consultant, bringing you another episode of Living the Wildlife as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family, I guess is the other only way to talk about it, so I'm here, really glad to have you on board here. I'm taking a little sort of a side trail here. Uh, normally I do a lot of interviews of people, and so, but I'm wanting to drill down today and talk a little bit about how to read technical papers or research papers, academic journal articles, because I suspect that many of you uh, don't know how to read those or perhaps you feel a little intimidated by them and I'm hoping to, to sort of open this world to you because there's a lot of good information that can help you and your business become more successful and trained and get an edge up on the competition. Because the fact is, the only way you're going to improve your business is doing something different than your competitors. And one way to get an edge on your competition is to improve your knowledge, your knowledge base. There is a lot of information out there, so I'm not going to talk about how to find that information. I'm going to talk about... Uh, how to read these journal articles effectively so you don't get overwhelmed by the amount of information. We'll have other other trainings about how to search the internet for journal articles and literature and that sort of thing and what where to find it. But today we're going to talk about how to understand in the architecture of technical articles and journals in the wildlife damage related fields and biological sciences. All right, so let's let's get started here. <clears throat> the first thing that you're going to encounter when you're looking at a journal article is the title. Now, what I have here, and by the way, I'm not violating any copyright law here. The first author, as you can see there, is Kurt Verkotter, and this he is a he works for the federal government. Nothing that the federal government does when workers do it, it's copyrighted. It's, it's it's open, it's public domain because it's our tax dollars at work, right? But I'm not here to talk so much about what this article is about. I'm here to talk about how to use this as an illustration for how to understand the structure of journal articles. So our title straight away is Fences and Deer Damage Management. I would suspect that some of you who live in deer country or have maybe not thinking about moving, maybe you're thinking about moving into deer control and deer fencing is certainly an area to explore and this would give you some information about different types of fence designs that may be you business might want to move into this, particularly those of you who live in more wealthier areas. So this might be an article for you to pick up. Nevertheless, the first thing we want to notice right off the bat is the title. You will see in a lot of academic journal articles that they tend to have long titles. This is to help for probably search purposes to be very descriptive. The, the idea in journal articles is to get as much information in a succinct form so that people can decide whether this article it needs to be read for them. So this is part of where that goes. So it's Fences and Deer Damage Management, a review of designs and efficacy. So when we look at, whenever you see the word review in a journal article, often what they're doing is they're looking at a vast array of journal articles and then they're synthesizing that information into one spot. Basically, it's kind of like, we're going to make this like the crib notes. Those of you remember the old cliff notes for high school and other types of notes that would help you read Shakespeare in a very short amount of time and give you the whole story plot and everything. Well, that's kind of what this journal article will do. It's a review of designs and efficacy. That's my, that would be my initial reading right off the bat when I see the word a review. It's a summary and analysis of all the other literature up to this particular point about deer fencing. Okay, So that tells you straight away, is this something you even want to read? The next section is obviously going to be the authors. So, and you may say, well, I don't care who the author is. You will, you don't care initially. You're absolutely correct. And you probably shouldn't care initially. But as you read more of these journal articles over time, but you'll find that there are certain names that rise to the surface 
in certain disciplines. Dr. Kurt Verkaterin is at the National Wildlife Research Center. He is world class in the area of deer research. There's another name here that's also world class. I worked for him, Dr. Scott Hingstrom, another gentleman who is world class when it comes to deer research. Now, I'm not expecting you to know that. The point is, is that if you begin to read deer literature, you will see those two names come up frequently. There are going to be others, don't get me wrong, there are others, but you're going to read their names a lot because that's a field that they've dedicated part of their life to. So the same way you and your business, you may become a specialist in bats, you may get a, become a specialist in beaver, maybe some of you do coyote specialties. The point is, is after a while, once you start focusing on a particular field, you tend to find more and more research to do within that field or more and more work because of that field. And that's what happens here. You kind of get a rhythm, you know what to expect, and you begin to come up with new questions and issues in that particular field. Well, that's what these two gentlemen, uh, Mr. Lavelle, could be probably Dr. Lavelle for all I know. I'm not as familiar with, I'm not familiar with him, so I don't know what his status is. I'm not here to diss people. I'm just simply to point out that you will begin to get an idea of what some of these names are. And then of course it tells you where they're from. The next thing you want to look at is the abstract. The abstract is basically a summary of the article itself. Read that. That is absolutely critical. Let me kind of scroll up here a little bit more. The abstract tells you very quickly, is this article worth your time? If you're reading the abstract and you're not intrigued or interested in what that article is about, chuck it, move on. Life is too short. There's another article for you to read. That's the beauty of these journal articles. Sometimes the abstract alone gives you what you're looking for voila, you're done. Now, why is this important? Because if you're doing some Google searching and you come across a journal article, a lot of these journal articles are behind firewalls and you have to have memberships, usually paid memberships, to get access to these journals. The abstract, however, is frequently allowed to be uh, indexed by Google and Google will allow you to read that. So what it tells you is that sometimes reading the abstract is enough, gives you enough information to answer the question you're looking for. Now, if you have the art, if you, if you get the article and you're looking at the abstract and I want to read the rest of it and it's behind a firewall, you then can take that reference Sometimes maybe to your local library, if you're living near a university, you can drive there and use the library. You can also look at some of your community colleges and probably use their library and you might be able to get access to this journal article because you'd have the complete reference for it. Those are just a little tip for you if you're looking to move on. Sometimes you can contact the authors directly and they will send you a copy of the article. Depends how interested you are in reading the rest of it. Or you can simply be joined, get some memberships in various societies. Wildlife Society certainly welcomes people who are wildlife control operators. I'm a member of the Wildlife Society. And so they give access to their uh, previous journal articles uh, as part of the regular membership of being a member of the Wildlife Society. I'll tell you, that, that privilege alone is what makes the membership worth it right there. So, but again, it's, it's your call. Why is this important? Because I think it's critical for wildlife control operators to try to stretch themselves. And I recommend you read one article a week. That's it. And some of the, and these articles tend not to be very long. This one's a review article, so it's 10 pages, but a couple of those pages are just going to be references. So you're not going to necessarily read those unless you're interested in finding additional resources. So they're not as long as you think, and sometimes there's graphs and charts in there that helps even shrink the amount of reading. So we're not talking about a ton of reading here, but this is highly packed uh, nuggets of information in these particular journals. It's not like reading a book, 
Okay, so the abstract is absolutely critical. The next thing you're going to see, depending on the journal article, is the keywords. The keywords are used to help index the journal article. So if you have some doubts about what sort of topics this particular article is covering, if you didn't necessarily get that from the abstract or from the title, the keywords will help you drill down even more. Okay, so that is basically the heading area of your journal article. Now we're moving to the next phase, which would be the introduction. The introduction essentially situates the article or the subject within the broader literature. Remember, journal articles are a conversation that the researchers are having with their peers and a wider audience. Scientific research is all about peer review. You you work on a project, you do an experiment, you do some research, you formulate your hypothesis, you develop a theory or actually a hypothesis, then you test it, you get your results, you then want to discuss those results, analyze those results, come to a conclusion, publish your results to the wider community scientific community who can then critique it and evaluate that information. So what the introduction does is the introduction says, why is this topic important? Who cares, right? Who cares about deer fencing? So the article will summarize other pieces of information pointing out why there's a need for deer fences, what other research has been done in the area of deer fences, and why does this article need to be written now? I mean, out of all the topics in the world, why this, why now? And that's what the introduction does for you. There is, it's a pile of information in introductions, and it's often written extraordinarily well. It's not so technical, it tends to be more narrative format, and it has a lot of interesting tidbits that can really like, oh, I didn't know there was, you know, $200 million of deer damage caused a year from deer browsing. And you're like, I did not know that, right? And so you'll find that often within the introduction itself. So as the introduction goes on, it's laying out sort of the history of deer fencing. And then it's going to get into some of the deer damage issues. We're still kind of in that introductory phase where it's kind of laying out what this research has been because this is mostly a literature review summary and that's what this article is about. It's about looking at what other people have done and summarizing that content. By the way, they're going to be reviewing some of their own literature because Hingstrom and Verkaterin have done work in the area of deer fencing themselves. So they're going to be concluding their own literature in this, this type of work. They talk about the type of damage. Here's an example. In New York, an average annual loss of $15,000 per orchard is common. Now, I don't know if there are any wildlife control operators living within that area of uh, New York where the orchard areas, I'm sure there has to be some. But don't you think that kind of information would be valuable for you to know that you're looking at an orchard and that the average orchard's probably suffering $15,000 worth of deer damage a year. Do you think that might help you in pricing? Do you think you might be able to market some of those farmers and see if they're interested in doing some fencing? I don't know, something to think about, but at least you now know something that maybe your competition doesn't know, okay? And then it talks about some government work, but again, all of this is sort of introductory, introductory material. Then they get into some, they're starting to look into some of the articles themselves where they're summarizing the information. Here we have a kind of cost of various types of fences. Notice we have woven wire, welded wire, chain link, poly mesh, poly rope, nine strand, modified uh, WW3, I don't know what that means, poly, uh, poly wire snow, offset high tension, slanted seven high tension, Penn State 5 high tension, poly tape second, baited electric. Wow. Did you know there were that many different deer fences? So and notice what it tells you, that what it costs per meter. Now often in scientific literature, they're gonna be using the metric system, okay? Don't get all bugged out about that. It's just, you'll get a feel for it over time, but a meter is about a yard, okay? So 10 to $15, Per meter is what it normally costs to do that. Do you think that might help you in your bidding? 
Of course, the date of the journal article is going to be important too, because obviously prices continue to go up, but at least it gives you some baseline. But look at what it's telling you. What's the longevity of this woven wire fence? Almost 40 years. Did you know that? All right, so I think you get the idea of what this type of an article can do for you. And so now, he, now they're going through and they're laying out the types of fences that are available and they're discussing this. And now we're getting into basically sort of the body of the piece now. And then they're talking about the transitioning over to fencing considerations. So typically in a journal article, you're gonna have, if it's an experimental journal article, you're gonna have the, the name, obviously, the abstract, the authors, of course, and then it's going to go into introduction, and then it's going to go into the methodology, and then it's going to talk about the results, and then it's going to have a discussion, and then sort of a conclusion. This is not an experimental journal article because it's a review, so it's summarizing all of these other journal articles. So here we have fencing considerations, and it's asking the question, what level of protection are we looking for? So notice these headings here. These headings are very critical. So you can scan this particular article and say, do I, am I interested in what the level of protection is for this particular fence? Or am I more interested in what the physical capabilities of the fence are? So here it says, when you're attempting to exclude or contain an animal, its size, intelligence, and physical ability must be considered. Well, that certainly makes sense. Since if you're trying to keep a deer out of an area, you're gonna think about how high can this deer jump, right? How do I stop that? How strong is the deer? Is it gonna be like a moose where it could just simply charge through an object and just simply trash it? Or is it gonna jump it, right? So those are, you have to think about, you have to know your enemy in order to know what kind of fence you're gonna be building. So. They talk about what the motivation factor is of the deer. Different deer are motivated to jump fences at different rates. So when you were looking at deer fencing, you have to ask the question, what, how motivated are deer going to be to try to get out or into this particular area? The more motivated they are, the higher they jump, the harder they work. That just makes sense. Okay. And of course, money. How much does this fence cost? Now they're getting into the types of money that's going to be occurring here and the deer behavior that's going to be involved. Notice how reading those headings help you move through the piece relatively quickly to sort of grab what you're looking for. Here's an interesting fact when it talks about economics, and that is, you may have already known this from your geometry class, but the larger the the, it's cheaper per square yard to, for a linear yard to fence a larger, more circular area than it is for a rectangular area. Look at what we have here. We have a perimeter of 30 even though the area is 36. So if we have someone's field, 36 acres let's say, versus a perimeter where it's shaped like this, like a rectangle, versus a perim versus this area, like a square, which has also an area of 36 acres. Notice the perimeter is smaller than the perimeter over here. That's important to know if you're looking to get into fencing, right? So the the more rectangular the property is, the higher the cost is going to be because there's going to be more footage around. The property than if it's more square like the more round it is which would be more of a square square is very close to being round of course it's going to be cheaper to do something that's square than to do the same area that's rectangular interesting fact now it moves into the different types of fencing that are available permanent wire mesh wire mesh fencing this talks about how high it's built how well does it work goes into slanted mesh fencing, barbed wire fencing, modified woven wire fencing, electric fences. These are all types of permanent fences. Gives you some interesting diagrams to look at. How does this how do these fences work? How there is two different types of electric fences. Positive negative system, all positive system and how the what the advantages and disadvantages of each of those are. Detailed diagrams here of what that fence should look like if you're trying to build some of these fences in order to make them appropriate so you don't have to worry about deer passing through them or jumping over them. 
Here we have high tensile electric fence, which is uh, one of the more cost efficient types of fence that are out there. It's, they also tend to be electric. Then it gets into semi-permanent or temporary fencing. Perhaps a client can't afford to have permanent fencing put up. Can you be someone who's putting up temporary fencing? Talks about attractant, the repellent laced fences. All of this is sort of description where they're summarizing all these different journal articles in one location. It's amazing. And all within 10 pages, all completely resourced. And then it deals with issues such as gates and the challenges with gates. And then you'll get down to the last area where they're summarizing their conclusions. And they'll also point out if there's any type of research that needs, that needs to be done that hasn't been done yet. And then the paper concludes, of course, with some acknowledgments. Often scientists are very keen on making sure that everyone gets credit who participated in some substantive level in the production of the, of the paper, including people that, have re, that reviewed it prior to it being submitted to the journal. And then the last section, of course, would be the literature cited. And this is, can be a wealth of information for you because, if, because they may cite something that intrigues you and you can look down into the references to find what that source is to do further research because everything's connected. Think of research like a vast spider web. You grab a strand, that strand gives you a lot of information, that strand brings you to another piece of information that then branches off in different directions. You may get something about a different bait that you have, a different trapping technique, a bit different control information, maybe a repellent or a pesticide that you can apply that can fulfill something that you didn't know could be done. You may learn something about animal behavior or biology to help you capture and mitigate the damage that they cause. You may learn something about a clue, a clue to how to identify their presence and damage better to have a key rule of thumb to distinguish this animal from that animal that you didn't know before. It is an amazing amount of information. So that is essentially a review of a review article that's part of a journal uh, a journal publication. Notice how many sources that they've used here. I told you there would be a couple of articles, uh, a couple of pages just in references alone. And here we have the authors going from right to left. We have Dr. Hingstrom on the right, Verkaterin, and then Lavelle. A little bit of bio at the bottom. And there you go. That's it. <clears throat> There's your journal article. And this is a review article. I'll have to do a future presentation talking to you about uh, experimental articles where they're doing some experimental work because how you read those is going to be a little bit different. So let me kind of summarize what's going on here with a review article. I would recommend reading the entire review article because it's probably, if it's a subject that's interesting to you, the whole thing will probably be valuable. I'm not telling you to read the bibliography. Okay, that's, that's a little bit too far, but you certainly can. I would certainly, if you find an area as you're reading the journal article and they reference something, let me kind of scroll down here, you'll notice how it uses in-text citation. Usually it's the first name of the author followed by the date. So Kaslik 1980. Let's say there's a statement here that you want to learn more about. It says, many state governments provide compensation for damage caused by deer. You're like, okay, well, uh, does which which states did that? So you can actually scroll down to the citations, and we want Kaslik. And here we have multiple Kaslik's, right? So Kaslik, here we go. I'm gonna sort of highlight it here for you. Notice Kaslik JW 1980 Deer Proof Fences for Orchards: A New Look at Economic Feasibility. Proceedings of the Vertebrate Pest Control Conference, Volume 9, 161 through 162. So you could then ask your librarian or try to do a Google search on this particular publication and you will likely find this one because this one would be available uh, on the internet. I know that for a fact. So others you may have some difficulty finding, but the point is, is you could still ask your librarian to help you locate this particular publication, perhaps use interlibrary loans, and then of course you can always try to contact the author of the article itself and see if they're willing to send you this particular 
peace if they're provided they're still alive. The other issue what you want to look at when you're dealing with journal articles and that is where is it sourced? Different journals have different prestige in terms of the quality of the information that they're providing. Just like there's a pecking order among wildlife control operators, who's the best trapper of, of uh, squirrels, who's the best coyote person. You may not know who the best person is, but you probably have an idea in your area or across the country, who is someone you would ask a question of if you had a problem with a particular animal. That kind of gives you an idea that, of course, we're not all equal, right? Some of us have skills that are much better than others. Same thing occurs among journal articles. There are certain journals that have a higher level of prestige, and there's a lot they can, they're so valuable that people are trying to publish in those journals that they can refuse our more articles. They don't have to just simply tra take the dregs to try to, try to stay alive. The Journal of Wildlife Management is certainly one of those, and I think this might be the bulletin here. Let me let me see. So when you look down here at the bottom, notice how it starts, Vercotter and et al, deer fencing. Then you have your page numbers. So let's go a little bit further. Here we have the Wildlife Society Bulletin. So this is not the Journal of Wildlife Management, but it's another peer. It's actually a sister publication of the Journal of Wildlife Management. The Wildlife Society Bulletins published by the Wildlife Society. The Wildlife Society Bulletin The Wildlife Society Bulletin is primarily taking articles that deal with some sort of practical element with wildlife management. The Journal of Wildlife Management tends to be much more theoretical, modeling, which is where they're trying to cr create like how many deer should be harvested in any given year and how would you model population rates, how would you how would you uh, evaluate resource use by deer in a particular area? That would tend to be the Journal of Wildlife Management. It tends to be much more abstract. The Wildlife Society Bulletin tends to be far more, how do I do X? How do I stop deer from doing this? How do I kill more deer? How do I make them infertile? How do I deal with deer disease or something? That would be something more in the area of Wildlife Society Bulletin. That's a simplistic approach. Obviously, there's overlap between these two journals, but it gives you a little idea. Both publications are published by this Wildlife Society. Not trying to give a plug for the Wildlife Society other than the fact that it is something that where they're doing research that is of interest within our field of wildlife damage management. This is certainly an organization you need to know something about, even if you never decide to join them. But those are two journals. When you see them, you're going to see, yeah, all right, there's, I got some quality here that I, that I should be able to trust. Doesn't mean you can't disagree with the research. Okay. You may th find the conclusions, you're like, ah, I don't believe it. And I, would, and I would encourage wildlife control operators, particularly those of you who tend to be, to, have, to be very analytical, who tend to have been in the industry for a very long time, who have really strived to be scientific in your evaluation of your work, where you're taking notes and you have an attention to detail, don't just simply reject that information out of hand. Just because a scientist says X from their experience doesn't mean your experience is necessarily wrong. Because remember, animal behavior can be different in different locations. I was reading some journal articles today that suggested that repellents may have different efficacy rates depending on the season of the year. I did not know that before, okay? I did not realize that. Where they were talking about where a repellent can be working great during the winter time, may not that same repellent may not work as well in the spring. So you may be using a repellent in the winter time and you're saying, "Oh, this repellent's awesome," but the other researcher is using is using the repellent in the spring and they're saying they're not finding it very effective and you can we can be arguing with each other when we're actually talking about two different things that the the repellent's the same but it works one way in the winter time and works another way in the springtime. So sometimes we talk past each other and rather than saying each other's wrong, we're dealing with different contexts, different parts of the country. 
can be different. I would think that certain animals may be attracted to certain baits better in certain parts of the country than they are in other parts of the country. So, but it point is, my point here is, is that don't simply reject the information you're getting out of hand, but don't simply swallow it naively. And sometimes wildlife control operators can feel intimidated because they don't have a big degree on the wall, <clears throat> they don't have a PhD, and we need to respect these people. They put a lot of time in their education, they, they deserve respect, but they're not God. It does, it does mean that we should be challenged by their information, that we should be informed with their information, but we shouldn't just simply bow down and worship it because you know what? Sometimes mistakes are made. And remember, you are biologists as well in the sense if you're paying attention to the type of work you're doing, you're learning about animal behavior as well. I think it's important to recognize that there are not all, not all wildlife control operators have the same observational skills. I'm not saying that, but some of you have a naturalist understanding of nature. And remember back in the 1800s, that's all we had was naturalists. These were people that walked out into the woods and just simply did their science by observing. They didn't have these sophisticated uh, experimental designs, right? They would go out and say, I, I want to learn about fox behavior, so what am I going to do? I'm going to go out and watch fox. Watch fox do their thing and take notes. Well, some of you are doing that in sort of a, a, an off-the-cuff sort of way, and some of you are paying close attention. Some of you are paying, are actually taking high-level notes. The bottom line here is, is that you have a wealth of knowledge. I remember I uh, worked with a with a wildlife control operator, we went to the wildlife society, and I could tell he was a little he was a little intimidated by what he was seeing around him. And I looked at him and I said, "Don't be intimidated by these people." I said, "You know a whole lot more about bat control and wildlife control than these people with their degrees." And I wasn't just trying to prop him up. I was trying to prop him up, but it wasn't just about that. I didn't want him to think less of himself be just because he didn't have a degree in the wall. Because that individual I knew was a very careful, diligent wildlife control operator who had a lot of knowledge between those ears. But it was a practical knowledge. So I didn't want to trash the, the researchers and scientists that were there at the Wildlife Society. That wasn't the point. My point is you could still hold your head up high by being a wildlife control operator, just don't be arrogant any more than someone who has a PhD should be arrogant. So we need to respect each other for the level of knowledge of what we have and what we've earned. So we can learn from each other. And I do hope that this conversation that I'm having that you can get a little idea of that these journal articles are not gonna be as scary as you might think they are. And I'm gonna do another one here. I'm gonna do one that's on experimental design. It's gonna be a little different structure uh, in a future podcast, but I hope this sort of introduction helps you understand that there's some great information out there that's readable, understandable, and that can really help your business. And sometimes it's that one gold nugget that makes a world of difference. I hope that helps. I'm Stephen Van Tassel, Wildlife Control Consultant. I do hope you drop me a line and tell me what you'd like to learn about and hear and love to get some feedback from you. Yes, even when I do things that you don't necessarily like, but I'd love to get some feedback from you. If you're interested in advertising on the Pest Geek Podcast, do reach out as well. We'd love to have you along as sponsors and talk about what that would be. If you're interested in being on the show, uh, definitely reach out. How do you get a hold of me? Well, it's actually quite simple. It's wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com, wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast. Make sure you give some comments and also join us on Facebook at the Pest Geek World. We would love to have you on board and raise some questions. And then, of course, go, us, you go on YouTube and subscribe for us there as well. <clears throat> love to hear from you. Thanks for watching. I'm Stephen Van Tassel, Wildlife Control Consultant, giving you another episode of Living the Wildlife. Why? Because we want you to live the wildlife, not be the wildlife. Take care. <laughs>